what do the gliders in this picture, the helicopter in this picture, and the jet airliner in this picture all have in common? Let's find out in Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machette. What the aircraft in these pictures, actually I'll add one more for good measure, what all these aircraft have in common is that they're pictured with automobiles. And in tonight's episode, we're going to talk about the relationship between cars and planes. Now, I think we have a photo of me sitting in my very first car. Do we, do we have that photo? Oh, we do. Oh, good. Here it is. Yep. An auspicious beginning, the Murray Fire Chief's car. But to go from this to these is the basis of our story. So let's dive in. There can be no better example uh, of the relationship between cars and planes than uh, this photo, which shows a young racing driver named Eddie Rickenbacker. Rickenbacker raced at Indianapolis and became the top-scoring U.S. ace in World War I. The launch of the Douglas World Cruisers in 1924, first flight around the world, and you see the cars there at Santa Monica seeing the airplanes off on their epic journey. Here's a nice uh, Pennzoil truck servicing a Sikorsky S-39 on its way to Catalina from Los Angeles. And here's an interesting photo. This is a Ford Model T uh, surrounded by Republic test pilots with a F-105 Thunder Chief in the background. This photo was taken in 1959, and it's uh, uh, kind of a, a photo essay on progress in machines from the car to the jet. And speaking of Fords, Ford built an airplane, the Trimotor. Now, the story really begins in terms of aerodynamics and streamlining applied to cars in the Golden Age. This is a Duesenberg, late 1920s. And by the 1930s, cars had a more aerodynamic shape to them, like you see here. And cars and planes were always uh, pictured together, uh, talking about progress and all the latest uh, technology. Uh, here we have a cord with a American Airlines uh, DST, Douglas Sleeper Transport, and another cord uh, roadster with Amelia Earhart and her Lockheed 10 Electra. Here's Donald Douglas, president of Douglas Aircraft Company, with his 1937 Buick, and a 1941 Woody Wagon used by Douglas uh, in their dispensary. Well, let's talk about post-World War II private planes. This is really a big step. And there's Mr. Douglas uh, climbing aboard the Cloudster, and you can see the automotive-style door. And there was uh, quite a connection. For instance, look at the interior here. This looks like uh, your grandfather's 48 Dodge, but this is actually the luxury interior for the Republic CB. Here's another one, very car dashboard-like interior. And this is the North American Navion. Both the CB and the Navion were marketed at the end of World War II. But wait, there was even a flying car, a combination of a car and an airplane. You could uh, detach the wings and the tail and drive the fuselage into town. And this, of course, was the Molt Taylor Aero car. And uh, you have to wonder <laughs> if uh, Failsafe didn't get a, um, or Dr. Strangelove didn't get an idea from this ad. Make a date with a Rocket 8, Oldsmobile 88. And the point here is that the aviation and aerospace terminology uh, overlapped the automotive world in a big way. Let's look at cars at the airport. I've used this photo before, but it's the first appearance of a Boeing 707 uh, in public in uh, New York in 1958. And uh, there on the ramp, we have a Hillman Husky. Here's the uh, tunnel built at LAX in the early 1950s when they extended the runways. And take a look at some of the automotive finery uh, entering and coming out of that tunnel. Pretty cool. Speaking of LAX, this is a very historic photo. Uh, you're seeing a Boeing 707 taking off in the background. That's an American Airlines Flight 2. It is the first jet transport to fly coast to coast in scheduled service on February 25th, 1959. Look at the photos. This is Spotters Hill. This uh, place is very popular today for uh, photographers. 
and it's on Imperial Boulevard south of the airport. But uh, look at some of the very cool automobiles in this picture. I personally like the Studebaker Hawk. That's my favorite. And I thought we'd take a little cruise uh, real quick around LAX and show you some of the uh, cars of that time period. Just a little uh, picture journey to uh, look at some of these cars. And how many Corvairs do you see in this photo? There's three. It was a very popular car back in the day. Here's the parking lot at the new control tower. Uh, the airport was dedicated in 1961. And, uh, oh gosh, Ford Thunderbird. Uh, Chrysler, uh, Plymouth Valiant, Nash Rambler, very cool uh, automobiles in that parking lot, even an Austin Healey. Here's the uh, theme building, or referred to as the Spider, and again, some very, very cool machines in the parking lot at that time. Cars in the Jet Age. This is the uh, General Motors Firebird 3 concept car. I think it needs more fins, personally, but uh, you can see the relationship between uh, jet airplanes and cars. Let's uh, look at a few more. Now, look at the coloration and the shapes of uh, this machine. This is the Convair Pogo, which is an experimental vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. But look at the lines of this and compare it to the lines of this. This is a 1964 Corvette Stingray. It was a revolutionary car in its day and really uh, aerodynamic streamlining uh, to the hilt. Uh, here's a 66 Roadster, and look at the lines of this car echoed in the uh, styling of the uh, Lockheed SR-71. This photo was taken at the Blackbird Air Park in Palmdale, California. I should mention that the airplane and the car were both built the same month. Uh, here's yours truly posing with an F-104 Starfighter at Mojave. And that's my friend, the late Howard Kaufman, with his prized 66 Corvette with the side pipes and the knockoff wheels. Beautiful car. And uh, this was a photo shoot for Vet Magazine. But let's compare this pairing to this pairing, the F-16 with a 1994 Corvette. This photo was taken by my friend Tony Landis at Edwards Air Force Base. Speaking of Edwards, here's the Ryan X-13 VertiJet in action with a Pontiac uh, Chieftain in the foreground. And um, this is always, an am <laughs> this photo has always amazed me because you've got uh, the driver and his wife sitting in the car. Uh, I'm sure she would rather be shopping, but that's another story. And there's the Air Force officer with the blueprints under his arm. So what's the caption for this photo? Hey, Fred, I think we should make the tail bigger. What do you think? Sure, Larry, let's go back to the drawing board. Really? But it's a cool photo. Well, you didn't think I was going to do video without a model box top, did you? Here's the Aurora Jaguar XKE painted by Jack Lenwood on the ramp with F-102s. And uh, maybe someone can explain the caption. Feel free to leave a comment uh, if you wish. But uh, this is the uh, Ford Mustang Mach 1 1969 debut. And to me, one of the coolest names of a car ever. Uh, with an automotive uh, slant. Uh, and the caption reads, if you haven't got a past yet, get a Mach 1 now. Uh, I'm still trying to figure that out. But I should mention that this ad uh, appeared uh, in uh, magazines and the media in 1969. Uh, I was in my final year of assignment in Northern Japan in the Air Force. And uh, they had a program called the Overseas Purchase Plan where you could order a car and it will be waiting for you when you got back to the United States at a substantial discount. So shameless plug, this was mine. Couldn't afford a Mach 1 on an airman's salary, but uh, this is the car that brought me out to California and uh, was my first real actual car. Miss it. <laughs> the car plane connection. Uh, Spirit of America, Craig Breedlove, uh, Bonneville racer. And uh, the thing looks like a jet on wheels. It was powered by a jet engine. But uh, let's look at the connection between engines and airplanes and cars. Of course, BMW made the engines for the uh, FW190 and a number of other German airplanes. And here, you always see ads with cars and planes in them. This is uh, unusual because the plane is featured with a car in the background. We're going to see in a moment. It's usually the other way around. But here's the Cessna Cardinal 
And they're trying to make the case that on the ground, it's a hotter sports car than the Corvette. Mm, okay. Uh, you notice the $5 coupon there. This was at a time in the uh, late 1960s, early 1970s, when uh, you could cut out that coupon, take it down to a flying school, and for five bucks, they'd take you up in a Cessna 150 for an intro ride. And um, it was the best $5 I ever spent, I'll tell you that. But uh, as I mentioned, the cars in the background, let's reverse that and see what, uh, what we come up with. Uh, here's a uh, Pontiac uh, at the airport with a quasi Pan Am DC-8 in the background, and the crew is uh, uh, getting off their flight and getting ready to drive home. Now, take a good look at this ad. Uh, if you are of a certain generation uh, that grew up in the 50s and 60s uh, and into the 70s, you'll remember that there were a number of Pontiac ads, uh, and you would notice uh, the initials. If you look under the uh, right headlights on this uh, car, you see the initials VKAF. These are iconic ads uh, painted by two artists. AF stood for Art Fitzpatrick, who did the automobiles. And VK stood for Van Kaufman, who painted the backgrounds. An amazing combination of uh, extreme talent and ability to portray these cars in an exciting way in two very distinctive uh, and different techniques. Let's look at a, a few more. Here we have the Pontiac Firebird with a Hughes 300 in the background. And a GTO with uh, some uh, quasi-looking sailplanes. Uh, the coloration, complementary colors of uh, red and green, the use of uh, the figures. Uh, these were just literally iconic images that uh, uh, graced magazines of that era. And uh, just an amazing collection. I should mention that uh, uh, Fitzpatrick and Kaufman did many hundreds of ads. Well, now we're going to look at some photos of cars and planes. Uh, this is my TR6 at Orange County Airport. In the background is the uh, Movie Land uh, Museum of the Air. And uh, this is a Fairchild 24H uh, and, a, and a Triumph TR6. Now, if you look at the left-hand side uh, of the photo, uh, you see that B-25 back there. Uh, Movie Land of the Air Museum was run by Tallman, uh, Tall Mance Aviation, I should say. That's Frank Tallman and Paul Mance. And yes, that is one of the B-25s uh, flown in the movie Catch-22, which was made two years earlier than this photo. All right, here's an interesting combination. That's a Grumman F9F2 Panther and a Nash Ambassador. And they were trying to make the point in the ad of uh, aerodynamic styling uh, with a jet age look. Let's go back in history. Here's a Saab J21, first flew in 1943, and the Saab 92 classic. Uh, which uh, went into production in 1949. And here's a Spitfire. And here's a Spitfire. And this brings us to cars with airplane names. This is going to surprise you because there's a bunch. Let's take a look. Uh, on the left side, we see the car and the name. And on the right side is the airplane that shares that name. Uh, some classics as you read down the list. But wait. There's more. You ready? Look at this. And yeah, I know it's a bit of a stretch, all the BMW SUVs, but uh, I'll tell you, if I had an X3, I would uh, make mine white. <laughs> and if I had an X1, it would be orange. And of course, who wouldn't want to fly supersonic in a Chrysler Concorde? But I think you get the idea. And finally, how aerospace technology improved the automobile. There was a tremendous connection between uh, pilot survival in accidents and aircraft and occupant uh, survival in automotive crashes. For instance, there were the aeronautical innovations such as seat belts and shoulder harnesses, inertia reel seat belts in the car so they weren't just dangling on the floor, and the uh, seat headrest that prevented whiplash in a rear end impact. And these all came from the ejection seat. Anti-lock braking systems and anti-skid braking systems. Color-coded enunciator panels. If you fly airplanes, you're well aware of the colored arcs on some of the instruments, which give you the range. In this case, you have the speedometer, green, yellow, and red as the speed increases. 
and flat black and anti-glare surfaces. Back in the day, uh, a tremendous amount of chrome on the cars and the windshields, uh, windshield wipers would be a, a highly polished chrome, which when you turn into the sun, especially on the West Coast where it's really bright, uh, it can be blinding. So uh, learning from anti-glare panels on airplanes, all these surfaces became flat black. Warning lights and chimes. This all came from uh, the jet cockpit, airplane cockpits with uh, audio signals to uh, tell you that something was happening. And adjustable control positions. Uh, back in the day, cars had controls that were fixed. Steering wheel was on a fixed post uh, aimed right at your chest, and um, you couldn't adjust it in terms of angle or distance. Uh, and the seats uh, were fixed. And so it was a a uh, revolutionary idea to make all the controls adjustable to your body position as they would be in an airplane. So we can see the amount of progress from the early jet age to today. And uh, I, the, I, there could be no better example in terms of the uh, transition between automotive and aeronautical safety engineering than the ejection seat, because what do you have? A headrest, leg and arm restraints, a five-way belt safety uh, harness with a quick release mechanism. And when you look at any car today with a young child in it, there's the same principle. And this has increased survival in automotive crashes uh, by uh, several hundred percent. So if you're going to dream, dream big. And there you have it, a look at the connection between cars and planes. And I'd like to thank the great folks and institutions that make these presentations possible. Thank you so much for celebrating aviation with Mike Bichat. Hope you enjoyed this episode. If you haven't subscribed, we'd love to have you on board. And please do hit the like button on the way out. That does help us with YouTube. As always, until next time, take care. <laughs>